And I want to thank the Lord for my co-workers. Thank God for Brother Hate. Thank God. Boy, I just don't like that name at all. I, I don't think I could ever get used to that name, Brother Hate. Mm. I want to call him Brother Love. I tell you, I've appreciated those Bible studies like you wouldn't believe. Oh, he just brought out some wonderful golden nuggets. I just appreciated it so very much. And then my co-worker, Brother uh, Beecher. God bless your heart, Brother Beecher. Brother Beecher, you've just preached beyond yourself. I've appreciated every message. You know, I'm glad he's an old-fashioned, second blessing holiness preacher. He's on the old line, and I thank God for him. He's got a sweet little wife. And I thank God for Brother and Sister Beecher. Appreciate him so very much and their wonderful truths. Then our youth evangelist, Brother Davis, I didn't get to hear him preach, but I know he's a good preacher and I know that he's done a wonderful job. And the children's worker, God bless their hearts. We've had a wonderful time working together. Praise the Lord. Then I want to thank the Lord for Brother Cope. I tell you, I appreciate this man. He and I worked together in a camp a few years ago and he preached holiness about every sermon. And I want you to know I enjoyed it tremendously. He's an old-fashioned holiness preacher. Aren't you glad for your precedent tonight? How many appreciate Brother Cope say a big amen? Amen. I think he's God's man in God's place doing God's work for God's glory. And we need to thank the Lord for Brother Cope. We want to pray much for him. He's got a big job. Pray much for him. Stand behind him. You know, when we were working at that camp, we were sitting at the dinner table <coughs> uh, eating, and he said, Brother Swan, did you know I got converted under your ministry? I said, Brother Cope, are you serious? He said, I'm serious. He said, I got saved under your preaching at Salem, Ohio. In that tent meeting, when Brother Shmuel wanted me to come for a tent meeting, he said, I got saved in that tent meeting. He said, Sunday night, I dreamed that the rapture took place or the second coming of Christ happened and I was left behind. He said, that really got a hold of my heart. And he said, Wednesday night, I went to the altar in that tent meeting and prayed through and God saved. Praise the Lord. And I'm proud, real proud of Brother Cope. I love you, brother. I think I'm going to hug you again. <laughs> we almost kissed each other, you know. That? <laughs> but I appreciate him so very, very much. God bless Brother Cope. I appreciate Brother Davis, the one that took up the offering. He's going to take me to the airport tomorrow. <clears throat> I'll be leaving out of here at 1030, catching the old jet plane, headed back to the Southland, back to Winter Haven, Florida. That's where I live. And so I want you to pray and ask the Lord to use me in the few years that I have left to live. Somebody said, uh, when you plan to retire, I said, I want to retire, I want to inspire. I said, too many preachers, instead of retiring, they've expired. I don't plan to retire. The only retiring I believe in is putting new ones on my car. It's the only retiring I believe in. I don't plan to quit. I don't like the word quit. I cut it out of my dictionary years ago. Years ago, I cut the word quit out of my dictionary and while I was at it, I cut out the word compromise. Both words are real close together and each word begins with a letter K. So I just cut them all out. I don't plan to quit. I don't plan to quit. I don't want to let up or shut up or back up. I want to keep preaching God's word as long as I possibly can. So pray for me as I fly out of here in the morning. Somebody said, are you afraid to fly? No, I'm afraid I'll crash. <laughs> Somebody said, Brother Swan, don't be worried about that. When it comes your time to go, you'll go. I said, what if I go down on the pilot's time? <laughs> the 
But you know, every time I get on that old jet plane, I always say, underneath, blessed Lord, are your everlasting arms. And I haven't crashed yet. By the way, I want to thank the Lord, too, by, for the good offering. And a life, he brought that check over, and I looked at it and said, good night, that's entirely too much. He said, well, you can always give it back. No, I plan to keep it because I have bills to pay just like everybody else. But I do appreciate the offering. I really do. I've never preached for the first dollar. Never, never, never. When I first started out in the ministry, I didn't even know they paid you to preach. I'd have paid them to let me preach. But I found out later they do pay you, and I was so thankful for that. But I've never preached for the first dollar. I was in a revival meeting a few years ago and I knew that I crossed the treasurer. And that's one you don't want to cross. <laughs> but I crossed him. Did you know I can always tell when somebody is sitting on me? I can always tell, listen, if I've studied medicine as long as I've studied humanity, I believe I know how to diagnose the case. I can always tell when somebody don't care for my preaching. That's right. What do you do? I just pray and ask the Lord to help me to go right on. I had a fellow come up to me, believe it or not, and I was at God's Bible school in a camp meeting. I don't know who my co-workers were, but one fellow came up to me and he said, I'm gonna sit on you tonight while you preach. I said, if you do, I'm gonna burn a blister on your bottom that you won't be able to sit down for six months. I don't think he sat on me that night. <laughs> but I've never preached for the first dollar, never. But when I crossed this treasure, I knew I crossed him. He didn't care much for my preaching. I didn't care much for his attitude. And after the revival came to a close, wife and I, we started to leave, got our instruments together, ready to leave. I never said one thing about the check. And we were almost ready to get in an automobile to leave when here come the treasurer. He ran out and he said, here, here, here. He said, take this check. He said, I hope it's enough to get you out of town. Can you believe that? I never even looked at it. I just folded up and put it in my pocket. I said, if it's not enough, I can always add a few dollars to it. And about that time, the pastor came to the front of the church outside. And he said, Brother Smart, did you get your check? I said, yes, sir, thank you very much. He said, how much was it? I said, you mean you don't know? And you're the pastor? He said, oh, Brother Smart, I learned a long time ago not to, not to cross that treasure. You know how long I'd last pass from that church? About as long as a paper shirt and a bear fight. That's right. It's pathetic what's going on today in a lot of our churches. I had a pastor call me at INS, Kentucky, and he said, I want you to come and preach for us. I said, I'll be glad to do it. What date do you want? He, he told me, and I looked at the schedule, and I had the opening. And I said, Brother Holly, I'll be there. The little independent church. Way back in Inez, Kentucky. That's back in Johnson County. I used to run around Johnson County, Kentucky before I was ever converted. Mm, it's a rough place. And I went, and wife and I, we couldn't even pull up to the church. There were so many boulders and rocks everywhere. And it wasn't even a church, it was a schoolhouse raised up on big rocks where the snakes could crawl in and out at will. I'm sure glad I wasn't will. Raised up on big rocks and you had to park your car and walk the rest of the way into the schoolhouse. You could see those old mountaineers come up out of the holler and down over the mountain. Carrying a baby on either hip. The wife had a baby on either hip. Coming in barefooted with the big overhauls on, calico dresses. It was in the summertime, those old moonshiners. 
But we never liked for crowds in that little schoolhouse. I mean, that little schoolhouse had just loaded packed every night. It wasn't a big schoolhouse. It wasn't too big, but it was packed out every night. They didn't have a nice pew like you have to sit in. It was just a little school desk. Didn't have a nice platform. It was just a flat floor. Never had a pulpit stand behind it. It was just a big old table. I was on top of it more than I was behind it. And it just tickled the fire to me to see those hefty women and hefty men come in and wiggle around to get in their seat, you know, that that school desk. They wiggle and finally sit down. I said, let's everybody stand for prayer. And they stood up and the desk came up with them. (laughs) But I want you to know we had a revival. God came in a wonderful way and some of those old timers came Weeping, them old bootleggers and hillbillies fell on their knees right on the floor and prayed through and got saved. I was there for 10 days. Pastor came up to me and he was weeping. He said, Brother Smart, we wish we could give you more, but this is as much as we can give you. I said, Brother Holly, whatever it is, I appreciate it. He gave me $68. I put my arms around him. I said, thank you, Brother Holly. I appreciate it more than what you'll realize. He told me on the phone before I got there that he couldn't promise me anything. I said, doesn't make any difference. I'll come anyway. I'm glad that I started out right. That's right. And I preached in all kinds of places. I preached in hen houses. I preached in homes, camp meetings, revival in churches. I'm glad that I started out right. I'm glad, thank God, that the Lord has caused me to die out to money. Amen. 68 bucks. Thank you. Wife and I got back in the car. We sat for old Williams from West Virginia for an old fashioned tent meeting. I said, honey, wasn't that sweet of those people? giving us $68. I said, honey, they did the best they could. And the Lord knows when we do the best that we can do. He knows all about that. So anyway, I just thought I'd just throw that out. By the way, I want to thank the Lord for the, uh, the duet for Mary and Penny. I love their singing. How many has enjoyed their singing? Say amen. Amen. I love to hear them sing. They sing from the heart, not just from the diaphragm. I like good spiritual singing. They put themselves right into it. I love to hear them sing. And I want to thank the Lord for the man that was playing the organ and for his wife that played the violin. I love to hear her play the violin. Playing the violin is harder than what you think. I mean, there's no frets on the violin. I mean, you usually have to kind of feel how far down you go <laughs> and far up. It's tuned up like a mandolin. I can play that like a mandolin. And you know, they have no frets at all. And listen, it's, and that's beautiful music. I thank God for that beautiful violin playing and the beautiful organ playing. You did a wonderful job. And the good man back there at the PA system, thank you, brother, for putting up with us. Thank you for putting up with my squeaky voice. I'm glad that you can turn me up and turn me down, but don't turn me down tonight. Just turn me up. I'm really glad to be here today, tonight. Say amen. amen. I love you crazy folk. I, want, I mean, you good folk. I want you to remember that. I love you and I thank God for you. And I want you to remember me in prayer. Shall we stand? Everybody stand up. Shake hands with somebody and say, we're happy that you're here. And remain standing for prayer.
Our Heavenly Father, here we are again in this big tabernacle, ready to preach your precious word. Thank you for help in other days, but I need your help tonight. I pray that you'll touch us, quicken us with thine own self. Tonight's the last night of the camp, and I want to be a blessing. I pray that you'll open up every heart and direct this message. I can't preach without your help. Holy Spirit, take charge. And for everything that you do for us tonight, I'll give you the praise for I ask these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have two verses of scripture that I want to quote in your hearing. You don't have to look them up. I'll quote them for you. The founder of the gospel of St. John, chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. Jesus is speaking. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that you might have life. Please listen closely to my text because my sermon is wrapped up in verse 40 where Jesus said, and ye will not come to me that you might have life. Now these are some of the saddest words that our Savior ever spoke. I wish I could reproduce his tender words and his loving look. As Jesus said in these words to the people in the New Testament times, Jesus came down from heaven with all of his glory to this earth, with all of his shame to bring life to men. He went among the people there in the New Testament and plainly proclaimed that life could be obtained by coming to him. But the scripture said uh, people would not come. At last he looked upon the people with a heart aching with disappointment and with yearning pity. And he said the words of my text, and ye will not come to me that you might have life. Now I believe the words that I'm using tonight as my text contain the secret of why it is anyone is lost. Everywhere I go on the evangelistic work, folk, I find people giving me excuses and objections why they're not serving the Lord, and I'm always glad to help them if I possibly can. Why are people lost tonight? If there's anybody in this congregation lost tonight, it is simply because you will not come to Jesus that you might have life. Many years ago, the Prince of Wales came to America. Everybody wondered what he came for. Somebody said he came over here to look upon our Republican form of government. Somebody else said, no, he came over here to look upon our various institutions. Somebody said, no, he came over here to spend a few days vacation. Well, the Prince of Wales came to America and stayed for a few days and went back. And from that day to this day, no one has ever found out why the Prince of Wales came to America. But over 2,000 years ago, the Prince of Heaven came to this earth. And he was here just for a short time, but thank God, he told us what he came for. He said, I came into this world not to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. John 3, 17. He said, I came into this world to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19, 10. You remember what Jesus said there in Matthew 23, 37? As he sat on a little hill overlooking Jerusalem, His heart was broken, tears running down his face. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and sown us them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thee together even as a hen doth gather her chicks under her wings, but ye would not. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, 29, and 30. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heaven laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall not, maybe, ye shall find rest to your souls, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, come on now. Let's search the scriptures. 
For in them you think I have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And then he quoted my text, and ye will not come to me that you might have life. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, no man or woman is lost because they've gone down so deeply in sin. You're not lost because of the number of sins that you've committed. You're lost because you won't come to Jesus that you might have life. I thought about the apostle Paul. Before his conversion, he was a wicked man in the sight of God. He was tearing down everything to look like Christianity and he thought he was doing God's work. He was persecuting the church. He was called putting the saints of God to death. He was a wicked man, an ungodly man. Yet one day while he was going down the Damascus road, a light flashed out of eternity and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice coming out of heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He looked up and said, who is that speaking? He said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. He said, you mean you're the one that all these Christian Jews are talking about? That's right. Well, he said, Lord, then that settles it. What would you have me to do? And the Lord saved that man, later on filled him with the Holy Ghost, and he became one of the greatest preachers that the world has ever known. God saved him, sanctified him, and he wrote 15 books out of the 27 books in the New Testament. God Almighty has saved that man, transformed his life, and made him a new creature in Christ Jesus. And he became a blessing to a lost world. If God saved that wicked, ungodly man, I'm persuaded to believe that he's able to save every unsaved person in this room. Regardless of who you are. Regardless of what you've done. Regardless of how deep down in sin that you've gone. The Lord loves you and he's able to save you. I thought about George Mueller. That great man of the yesteryears, a godly man. Yet he was an ungodly man before he was converted. For 16 weeks, he was in bed with the terrible disease that had contracted by sin. He was in jail at the age of 17. He was a habitual drinker and smoker at the age of 18. But one night, George Mueller was invited out to a college prayer meeting. And when he got there, he noticed that the people possessed a happiness that he did not possess. And later on that night in his room, old George Miller fell on his face before God and confessed his sin and the Lord answered his prayer and gave him the pleasure that forgiveness brings. Now if the Lord did that for old George Miller, he's able to do that for unsaved people in this congregation. He's able to forgive you of all of your sins if the Lord changed Paul's life and Paul said he was a chief of sinners and yet the Lord saved him. George Wheeler was a wicked man but the Lord saved him and the Lord's able to save you. If you're here tonight and you're bound down by the fetters of sin, I've got good news for you. The poet was right when he said, there is a fountain and this filled with blood and drawn from the manual's veins and when the sin is plunged beneath this flood and they can lose all their guilty stains. I'm glad the Lord is specializes in hard cases and there's nothing too hard for him. He's able to forgive you, he can liberate you and he can set you free. Hallelujah. No, you're not lost because of the number of sins you've committed. You're not lost because you've gone down so deeply in sin. Honey, you're lost because you won't come to Jesus that you might have life. He's the life giver. John 14, 6 said, I am the life. That's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want life, seek Jesus. If you want to know the way, seek Jesus. If you want to know the truth, seek Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's able to forgive you. He's able to save you. He's able to liberate you, can set you free, and give you something in your heart the world doesn't know anything about. Number two, you're not lost because you need to be lost. You know, some people think they just need to be lost. 
You're not lost because you need to be lost. I know there's a false belief out there that some are predestined to eternal life and others are predestined to eternal damnation. I don't believe that. I believe that everyone is predestined to eternal life. If they'll come to Jesus with a broken and a contrite heart, the Lord will never turn you away. He'll forgive you. Just about everybody here in this room could quote John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that little word, whosoever, is universal in its scope. It takes in you, it takes in me, it takes in everybody. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to walk out of this tabernacle with condemnation on your heart. You can be saved. You don't have to be lost. Years ago, a man said to me, he was supposed to go to hell. I said, why do you say that? He said, my daddy's in hell right now burning. My daddy had no time for the church, had no time for God, no time for the Bible. And he died just like he lived and he went to hell. He said, my mother's in hell. She's burning in the flames right now. She had no time for the church, no time for prayer, No time for the Bible. And he said, my mother died just like she lived. (coughs) And she's in hell. And then he went on and said, I got a sister that's rotting away right now in a nursing home. She had no time for God, no time for the Bible, no time for Christianity. And she's gonna die and go to hell. She's gonna die and go to hell. She's gonna die just like she lived. I mean, she's gonna be, go to hell. She's a lost woman. And he said, I guess that's where I'm supposed to go. I said, now wait a minute, sir. I said, you don't have to go to hell because your daddy did. You don't have to go to hell because your mama did. And you don't have to, you don't have to go to hell because that's where your sister's going. I took the blessed old Bible and showed that man how he could be saved from all of his sins. And he got saved. He prayed through and got right with God. You know who that man was? It was my own daddy. It was my father. He said, I'm afraid that's where I'm supposed to go. Daddy went there, mama went there, my sister's going there. I guess that's where I'm supposed to wind up. I says, no, daddy, you can be saved. The Lord's able to forgive you of all of your sins. And my precious daddy prayed through and got saved and went on and got sanctified and lived a victorious Christian life for years and died with leukemia and went to heaven. I had the privilege of preaching his funeral. Felt like heaven was just a few feet away. You're not lost because you need to be lost. Second Peter 3, 9 said, for the Lord is not slack concerning his sweet promises as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward. Not whether that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You don't have to go to hell. If you're here tonight in this tabernacle and you're not saved, don't you walk out of this tabernacle with an excuse on your lips I guess I'm just supposed to go to hell. Or I'm just such a wicked sinner. I just don't believe that the Lord can save me. That's a lie out of the pit. The devil is a liar. The Lord loves you. And the Lord's able to forgive you. The Lord's able to set you free. You're not lost because you need to be lost. One day Jesus came into this world, got a hold of sin, and sin reached up and got a hold of him. And they followed out in the night. And finally the spotless, sinless son of God said it is finished. And when he said it is finished, he shut the jaws of damnation, built a bridge over hell, over hell, opened up the pearly gates and steps out with outstretched arms and says now whosoever will just let him come. Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 said, the spirit and the bride say come. 
Let him that heareth say come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. No, you're not lost because you need to be lost. All through the Bible, God said, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And it's not his will for you to go to hell. I mean, if you go to hell, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, if you go to hell, you'll go there as an intruder because God doesn't want you to go there. He wants to save, he wants to forgive you. He wants to write your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. He wants to give you the sweet assurance in your soul that you've been born again. Wow! Thank God for that sweet assurance that we're born again, that we've been forgiven, that we're on our way to the city. I feel like saying this world is not my own. I'm just a passing through. Let me tell you something else. You're not lost because you're too weak to live this Christian life. I used to say that to my mother. My mother got saved first. I said, Mother, I just don't believe I I just don't believe I can live it. She said, Honey, you can't live it. I said, What? She said, You can't live it, but Jesus can help you to live it. I couldn't understand that then. I said, Mama, I'm just afraid that I'll still want to shoot my poo. I'm afraid I'll still want to shoot crap. Roll my dice. I, I just believe I'll still want to run around uh, and do these wicked things that I've been doing. She said, honey, get saved uh, and the Lord will clean you up from all of that trash. Wow! I know exactly what mama meant. Not then, but now. That night that I prayed through, I couldn't hardly wait to get home. Tell my mother the good news. She went to the Pilm Hole in the church that night. I went to the Nazarene church that night. They came to my house, had a cottage prayer meeting, and I went to that Nazarene church that night, and I prayed through and got saved. I could not wait to get home. When I walked in that old home place, my mother standing there smiling, her face shining. I said, Mama, guess what? She said, Honey, I believe you got saved tonight. I said, I sure did. And we hugged each other in that old kitchen. I reached in my pocket and got the old Chesterfields or camels or whatever was not smoke anything. I went over to the old coal stove, raised up the cap. I threw those old cigarettes in, watched them burn up. Went upstairs, got the old deck of greasy cards and I burned them up. Got the old dice I used to rattle and roll and I burned them up. Got all those sexy magazines I used to, I used to look at and I burned them up. What were you doing, Brother Smart? I'll tell you what I was doing. I was a stripping for the race. That's what I was doing. Whoa. I was stripping for the race. And by the way, if you pray through and get saved, you'll strip for the race too. <laughs> I'm so glad my sweet little mother, she had a lot of sins. She said, honey, you know you gotta get in bed before you fall out. Nobody ever fell out of bed until they get in bed. That's good philosophy. She said, you get saved, honey, and the Lord will pour in the grace and the power and the strength that will enable you uh, to live a victorious Christian life every day. I couldn't understand it then, but I understand it now. You're not lost because you're too weak to live this Christian life. I know there's a belief out there you sin a little bit every day and worth all it is. I'm smart enough to know that's the only way you can sin. No, no other way you can sin is worth all it is. Big preacher come to my part of the country one day and put up a big gospel tent and seat about a thousand people. And the place was loaded down with the people. And this big well-to-do preacher, I could name him and maybe some of you folk would know him. He was a Baptist. He got up one night, thought he may be having a good time. He said, is there anybody in this congregation that's lived today without committing one sin? If so, stand up. Two men in the back stood up. Dr. So-and-so squinted his eyes and looked, said, you mean you two men have lived today without committing one sin? Yes, sir, doctor, we have. Would you come up to the platform, please? And those two men came to the platform. 
Dr. So-and-so wanted to poke some more fun at him. Said, you mean to tell me and everybody here I'm under this tent that you live today without committing one sin? He said, yes, sir, doctor. By the grace of God, we've lived today without committing one sin. And doctor said, look, everybody, here's two little angels. Look, everybody, here's two little angels. And people just laughed. And one of the men said, Doctor, have you sinned today? He said, of course. We all sin a little more or less every day. And the fellow said, doesn't the Bible say, he that sinneth is of the devil? Look, everybody, here's a little devil. Look, everybody, here's a little devil. They closed that tent. They moved to someplace else. God's able to keep you. I mean, if the devil can make a perfect sinner, I believe God can make a perfect saint. I never saw a sinning Christian in my life. You never either. A sinning Christian, you can't be two things at the same time. You're a man, you're not a woman. You're an American, you're not a German. If you're fat, you're not skinny. If you're white, you're not black. Turn your brain over and think a little bit if you've got one. If you're a Christian, then you're not a sinner. You know what it said in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, 12, 13? The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us to denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope of the Lord's appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can live godly in this present world. And when you're living godly in this present world, you're not sinning. Jude chapter one, verse 24 said, now unto him that's able to keep you from falling. David said in Psalm 26, one, I have trusted in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. You don't have to slide back. Let's go forward. God can keep you. If you'll keep your little hand in God's big hand, that's what Sister Peabody used to say to us at God's Bible school. Keep your little hand in God's big hand. He can pull through you ever through ever battle and trial and temptation that comes your way. If he can get enough of you, he can pull you through a knot hole. God's able to keep you. Are you a sinner? God loves you, sinner friend. And the Lord is able to save you, liberate you, set you free, and give you grace and power and strength that will enable you to live a victorious Christian life every day. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You're not lost because you're too weak to live this Christian life. You're lost because you won't come to Jesus that you might have life. You say, brothers, why is it people won't come to Jesus? Well, there's many things that keep people away from Jesus. We all know what it is. It's a love of sin. This keeps more people away from Jesus than any one thing I know of. What caused a prodigal son to leave home and get into trouble and wound up in a hog pen? It was sin. What caused Judas to betray his Lord and go out and hang himself? It was sin. What splits the home? What blasts the lives? What damns the soul? It's sin, S-I-N, sin. There's not a three letter word in the English vocabulary that covers as much territory, done as much damage as a three letter word sin. Sin was born in the heart of the devil and transported to this earth by him. Sin lifted up his slimy head in the Garden of Eden and attempted our foreparents that brought about the universal curse on the human family. You can't even pronounce the word sin without hissing like a serpent. The wage of the sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Wherefore is by one man's sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Romans 5, 12. Oh, I know. I wasn't born yesterday. 
I know there's a lot of people who like to be a Christian, but they know they're going to have to leave their sins behind. So I say, I like to be a Christian, but they want to hang on to the things of the world. They want to hang on to sin. You say, how do you know? I lived on that side of the fence. That's the reason I can preach the way I do. I didn't get this from the internet. I got it from the upper net. I know a lot of people like to be a Christian, but they know they're going to have to leave their sins behind. You can't come to Christ and retain your sins. God has given everybody in this room a power that no other creature has, and that's a power of choice. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. You've got a choice to make. The Lord said, I've said before you uh, are the way of life and the way of death and you're standing at the forks of the road. Which way will you go? You've got a choice to make. It's either turn or burn. You've got to separate yourself. Isaiah 59, 2 said, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you. Sin hides the face of God from us. Isaiah 55, 7 said, let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and our God will have mercy and will abundantly part. There is a separation. You just can't retain your sin and be a Christian. I'm so glad I settled it 64 years ago. I'm glad I made the right choice. I'm glad, I'm so glad I got under the old constitution. Praise the Lord. It's a love of sin that keeps people away from Jesus. Sometimes it's a love of money that keeps people away from Jesus. Matthew 13, 22 said, the cares of this world. Oh my God. The cares of this life. And the deceitfulness of riches. It chokes out the word and it becomes unfruitful. I know people tonight that's backslidden because of money, the love of it. It got the best of them. My co-worker talked a little bit about that today, I think. The love of money. When, it gets a, when that almighty dollar gets in the way of the almighty God, we are done for. You know what David said in Psalm 69, 5, 69 uh, 10? He said, if riches increase, don't set your heart on them. I know preachers tonight that's walking around in the shadows. They're walking around with an unblessed life. No God. Just a form. All because of the love of money. Years ago, I held a revival in Kentucky at the Pilgrim Holy Church for a preacher. He and I went to school together at GBS. He had a beautiful wife and a beautiful family. He called me for a revival meeting. I went. He's making good money. He was an air conditioning man. He was an electrician. He worked on automobiles, a real good mechanic. Making money hand over fist. And the church that he pastored was a poor little church, but they was, they was paying him a decent salary. And they was bringing in a lot of garden, a lot of produce out of their garden. Wife and I stayed right there. We had a trailer, but after the service was over that Sunday night, I knew something was wrong with that man. You know, I've gotten around some people, when they bat their eyes, I see the dollar marks. 
They're so consumed with that money. What's in it for me? How much do I get out of it? They got a cash register for a brain. I knew something was wrong with that preacher. And I preached Sunday night just like I'm doing. This is not Sunday. But the last night of the revival, I preached with a burst and earache. I don't know which is worth. A toothache or an earache. They're both about the same. And I preached with both of them just killing me. And after I got through preaching, we went to the parsonage to have some fellowship. While we were sitting around the table, I said, Pastor, I said, I preached tonight with a burst and earache. He said, that was the Holy Spirit trying to tell you to take up a love offering for me. I couldn't believe it. I said, now brother, they're paying you a decent salary and they've been bringing in a lot of garden stuff. You're making a lot of money doing this and doing that. I just didn't feel like Take it up and offer a love offering for you. have been milking the people trying to get us a good offering. And I just didn't feel like taking a love offering up for you. They're having a hard time. And the wife spoke up and said, well, you could have taken it up in pledges. I said to my wife, when we went back to our trailer, I said, honey, I don't want to ever go back to that church as long as he's there. And did you know it wasn't long till he began to let down? It wasn't long till he quit pastoring. He got caught up so much in, in, in working in jobs and making big money. It wasn't long until he backslid. And it wasn't long till his wife backslid. And it wasn't long till his wife, his children got on dope. And tonight far away from Jesus. I've seen preachers go down because of that love of the almighty dollar. That's all they think about it. I've seen laymen go down in defeat. It went down with the crash because that money got the best of them. They begin to prosper. Did you know there's a lot of things that money can buy? There's a whole lot of things that money can't buy. Money can buy finery, but not beauty. Money can buy books, but not brains. Money can buy a bed, but not sleep. Money can buy food, but not an appetite. Money can buy a crucifix, but not a savior. Money can buy a church pew, but not heaven. What's a few hundred dollars anyway, folk? What's a few thousand dollars? What's a few million dollars compared to the soul? Did you hear what it said in Mark chapter eight, verse 36? What shall it profit a man if he should gain the word? He didn't say you would. He said, what should it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and then lose his own soul? What would he give then in exchange for his soul? Bill Gates I don't know whether he's the richest man in the world now or not, but Bill Gates has got a whole lot more money than I have. Here's some time ago, he built a hundred million dollar home. It's got a hundred rooms in it. Oprah Winfrey, she built herself a 50 million dollar home. But that doesn't make a person happy. I can do the same thing Bill, Bill Gates does. He puts his britches on like I do, one leg at a time. I'm sure he doesn't jump in them. I can do that, Bill Gates. 
He can lay in one bed at a time, just his body, one bed. I can do that. Eat one meal at a time, I can do that. Money never did make anybody happy. The poorest man in this room is that individual that's got money, but they don't have Jesus really dwelling in their hearts. That's the poorest man in the world is that individual that doesn't have any more than just money. Money can never buy you health. Henry Ford, Henry Ford one day pulled up in front of something and his chauffeur opened up his door and Henry Ford got up, got out and said to his black chauffeur, I'd give all of my riches if I could trade stomachs with you. There's people tonight would give anything if they had that health. Money can't buy health. There's a lot of things money can buy, but there's some things that money can't buy. The love of money has damned a lot of people. You say, well, Brother Smart, that's not my trouble. And it could be the love of pleasure. Did you know I know some people would never give up their picture shows or their big televisions or their bingo parties or their card parties or their dance halls? I know. I know some people would never give that up to go with Jesus. But that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to surrender your all to him. I surrender all. The love of pleasure has damned a lot of good young people and the love of pleasure has damned a lot of good mamas and daddies and husbands and wives. I don't deny the pleasures of sin. I've got enough sense to know that. I don't deny the pleasures of sin, but they're fleeting. I remember before I got converted, I'd go out, I'd do everything I was big enough to do, and then I'd come home, and I'd try to go to sleep and couldn't. I'd beat the pillow and turn it over and beat it some more, turn it over and beat it some more, and my mother would climb out of that bed, and I could hear her praying for me. Oh, God, have mercy on Marshall. I'd come in sometimes drunk as I could be. I'd tiptoe because I didn't wake up my daddy. My daddy would have killed me. And I'd go up those stairs and I'd get so sick I'd puke all over the walls. Run into the bedroom where I slept. My mother would come in and she'd go downstairs and get the wash pan and, and clean the vomit off of the walls and then come in and wipe my face and pray for me. Thank God for a mother like that. Oh, God save my boy. If it hadn't been for goodness of Jesus, I wouldn't be here tonight. I don't deny the pleasures of sin, but they're fleeting and you know it. I know it. I lived over there on that side. I used to say to my buddies, what are we going to do tonight? And we go out and do it. And after it was over, it was just a dullness. What are we going to do tonight? The next day, what are we going to do tonight? It was a rat race. I got so weary of that. That's the reason I said, my God, there has to be something better than this stupid life that I'm living. Oh, happy day. When I woke up and turned my little peewee brain over and started thinking a little bit what was gonna mean for me to drop into the flames. And I'm so glad that Jesus had mercy on me. And when Jesus saved me, he just cleaned me up from that stuff. Praise the Lord. My buddies dropped me like a hot potato. So what, big deal. My girlfriends, they dropped me like a hot potato. I said, let them go. They look better going than coming anyway. I got more friends now and I don't know what to do with. Thank God. Praise the Lord for an old time religion that can clean a person up. 
Clean a man up, clean a woman up, clean a young person up. Give them joy and peace and happiness and satisfaction and contentment. Something the world doesn't know anything about. Hallelujah. I used to love to dance. Just give me a woman. I'd get that woman. I'd dance with her and we'd glide across the floor while the lights were turned down low and the, the band was playing a beautiful number and I glided across the floor with her. I felt so good. But it's when the lights went out and the band quit playing. And I tried to go to sleep and couldn't. I was miserable. I was so unhappy. I'm just saying nothing can satisfy you like Jesus. He's the only one that can satisfy you. That's right. And I'm so glad that I found the answer. Is that your trouble tonight? I'm not saying that everybody in this room are Christian. I know better than that. There's people here that need God. Let me ask you a question. Are you really happy? Do you have that contentment, that joy? Do you have that assurance in your heart that if you were to die tonight, you'd go to heaven? Brother, I tell you, at one time, I was so fearful of that. I've been cut slightly with a knife, shot at a few times and missed. I've been, had people to roll me, took every dollar I had after I got drunk, shoved me out of the automobile, and I laid over in the ditch in my own filth and vomit and shame. Brother Smart, are you satisfied with what Jesus has done for you? You better believe it, buddy. He's the only one that can satisfy the long of your soul. The world can't do it. Booze will never do it. Drugs will never do it. Sex will never do it. It's going to take Jesus to satisfy the longing of your soul. Go ahead and live the way you want to live, but you'll find out that it doesn't satisfy the longing of the soul. Pleasures of the world are so fleeting. Have a good time for a little while, then it's all over. You'll say, Brother Smart, that's not my trouble. So, love of money? No. Love of pleasure? No. Then it could be the fear of public opinion. Maybe you're afraid of what people might think if you got saved. Do you hear what that wise man said in Proverbs 29? 29. I forgot what verse it is. I slipped away. He said, the fear of man bringeth a snare. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare. How many young people as well as older folk that I know, they've been snared right here. They're afraid. I'm afraid of what people might think. Honey, quit worrying about what they might think about you. They don't think about you half as much as you think they think about you. You won't be dead six months to a year until eventually you'll be forgotten. Oh, you'll remember every once in a while, but soon it'll be gone. Don't worry about what people might think about. They don't think about you as much as you think they think about you. What does God think about you? Never mind what she thinks, what he thinks, and what them think. What those people think, don't worry about that. What does God think about you? I didn't care what my buddy saw when I went to the altar. I went to the altar because I wanted to be saved. It didn't matter to me what anybody thought after I got saved. And that's why I feel now. It doesn't matter to me what people think. I hope they like me and think well of me, but it doesn't bother me. I've made my mind up for time and eternity. I'm going to live for Jesus. What will people think? How many people's lost tonight because of the fear of public opinion? I'm just afraid. I'm afraid they'll make fun of me. 
I'd rather have a few people make fun of me down here for doing the right thing as to do the wrong thing, go to hell, have the devil to laugh at me for doing the wrong thing. I'm glad I settled it a long time ago to go with God. Before I came over here out of that little cottage of mine, I said, I know that not everybody's going to mind you tonight. I know it. I said, in spite of everything, there's going to be people walked out unsaved. That's all up to you. I said, Lord, but give us a few honest hearts. Not everybody's going to get saved. Not everybody's going to heaven. But Jesus, give us a few honest people. Are you afraid of what people might think? Don't worry about it. I know a lot of moms and dads and husbands and wives and young people, they're just afraid of what people might think. I'm afraid they'll laugh at me. What will they, what will they say? Don't worry about it. That night that I went to the altar, I didn't care who was in the church or who was out of it. I didn't care who was there. I was there to do business. I wanted to get saved. I wanted to get born again. I wanted Jesus to come into my heart. And it didn't matter to me who was there. And I feel that way to this day. It doesn't matter. Maybe that's the reason you're not saved. I'm just afraid of what people might think. Fully. Do what you know is right. You say, well, Brother Smart, it's not that. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is why you're not a Christian. It's because of procrastination. You say, what does that mean? That means putting it off. Putting it off. I'll get saved someday. I'll get sanctified someday. I'll get reclaimed someday, 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 someday. I'll wait until I graduate from high school. Then I'll get saved. I'll wait until I graduate from college and I'll get saved. I'll wait until I retire, then I'll get saved. I'll wait until I get married, then I'll get saved. I'll wait until I get my family reared and then I'll get saved. I'll get saved when I move away from this community and get a fresh start. You know what you are? You're a yellow belly coward. That's what you are. If that's the condition you're in, you're a coward. Putting it off, waiting till a more convenient season. I think I'll wait until I think I'm gonna die. And then I'll look up and say, Jesus, come into my heart. That's the most foolish thing that you could possibly do. Putting it off. To a more convenient season. I got a cousin tonight that's burning in hell and he committed the same thing that I'm preaching about. Procrastination. His name was Raymond Thomas. 40 some years old. <laughs> Had a sweet family. Hmm. He drove 100 miles to talk to me about his soul. 100 miles. I did the best that I could, folk, to help him get saved. I did everything I could to help him get saved. We talked about general things. Pretty soon we got down to the nitty gritty. I said, Raymond, God's been awful good to you. He said, I know it. He said, you see that new car sitting there? Yes. He said, I own it. There's not a penny against it. I said, I'm glad you own that car. He said, you know the house I live in in Dayton, Ohio? I said, yes, beautiful home. He said, I own that home. Not a penny against it. I said, I'm so happy that you own your home. He said, I'm foreman at the Sunshine Biscuit Company here in Dayton, Ohio. I said, I'm so glad you're foreman at the Sunshine Biscuit Company. He said, I make big money. I said, good. I'm glad you make big money. He said, I've got money in the bank. I said, go ahead, sack it up. I'm glad you make money. I'm glad you're saving your money. Go ahead. But I said, Raymond, you're not happy, are you? He says, no, I'm not. He said, Marshall, 
I'm not happy. I've got all of this, but I'm not really happy. He said, why is that? I said, I'm going to tell you why that is. When God Almighty made you, he put so much of himself in you that you'll never be happy and satisfied until you come in contact with him. The Bible said he put eternity in your heart. And there's only one person that can fill that void up, that vacuum. It's not money or property or anything like that. It's gonna be Jesus that will fill that vacuum up. Raymond, you'll never be happy like God wants you to be until you open up your heart and let Jesus come in. I did everything I could to help him. Finally, he said, I gotta go home. I prayed with him standing there, put my arms around him, hugged him, I wept, he wept. I said, please, Raymond. He got in his automobile and left. Went down that big long lane, crossed a little creek up to Star Route. He got out and he waved at me. I waved back. That was the last time I saw him alive. About two or three weeks later, his wife called me. Her name was Gates. She's screaming on the phone. She said, my God, by the fire, get here as quick as you can. I said, Gates, what in the world? She said, get here as fast as you can. I did. I walked into the house. I said, Gates, what in the world is wrong? She said, you won't believe this, Marshall. I said, tell me about it. He said, my, she said, my husband got up like he does every morning, came down, stairs to the breakfast table, ate his bacon and eggs and toast and jelly and drank his orange juice got up, placed a kiss on my lips, and started to leave to go to work. And he found out that he needed a handkerchief. I told him upstairs in the dresser drawer. He went upstairs, opened the dresser drawer, reached down and got his handkerchief, and he saw the 38 Smith and Wesson right there. And the devil said, pick that pistol up and put it in your pocket. He picked that, he picked that pistol up, put it in his pocket. Went in the bedrooms, kissed his children goodbye. Now listen, went downstairs, kissed his wife goodbye again. I can take you there tonight and show you the place. He kissed his wife goodbye, he walked out. Closed the little gate behind him, waved at his wife at the front door. Waved at his children from the upstairs bedroom window. Went up the sidewalk just a little ways. He turned right, went up at this alley, and there was a big sunshine biscuit company. <laughs> he unlocked the doors, got the machinery ready to run for the day. Stepped into the bathroom, closed the door behind him and locked it. And maybe he looked at himself in the mirror, but he reached in his pocket and pulled out that pistol and put it up the side of his head, and a bang, and a flash, and blood, brains, skull, slammed up against the wall. Somebody in the apartment heard the report of the pistol and kicked the door down, and walked in, and there laid my beautiful cousin, 40-some years old, lying there with a smoking pistol beside of him. Some of his head was gone, and his eyes were half shut and half open. I wonder what he saw. Did you know my cousin Raymond Thomas is still fallen? He's still fallen. My God, what a funeral. The undertaker did the best they could to fix his head up. an awful funeral. I looked down on his cold, dead face. I said, my God, Raymond, why did you do that? Why did you do that, Raymond Thomas? You had money in the bank, man. You made big money. You owned your house, owned your car, looked at your beautiful wife, children. Why did you do that? It's 
to him like something came to him and said, you never know what you'll do when you say no to God for the last time. That's right. The preacher got up and preached a wonderful message. He was given an altar call. People were coming to the altar. But way in the back, sitting on the last pew, there's a bunch of young people that covered that one whole back pew. They had their songbooks open like this. During the, con- during the invitation song. But they had their book up in front of their face. They weren't singing that invitation song. They were laughing and making fun at the people going to that altar. They were just giggling, sniggering and laughing as the people came to the altar. But there was one young boy that was seated on the last, at the end of that seat. They were all standing up and that boy, he wasn't laughing. He wasn't making fun. He had too much mother wit sense to laugh and make fun at the people going to that altar. He was looking at the words of that invitation song and the Holy Spirit was moving on him. And he said he was almost ready to go to the altar. I was just about ready to close my songbook when somebody touched me with her elbow. He said, I looked at all those young people. They had their book up in front of them and they were laughing and sniggering and making fun at the people going to that altar. He said, I made it up in my mind while standing there. I wouldn't go to that altar to have those young people laugh and make fun of me. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. I won't go to that altar to have those young people laugh at me. No, sir. All of a sudden, he said, I felt something crack. He said, it sounded like the report of a pistol. And he was relating this story to a preacher years later. He said, preacher, God's gone. God's gone. Preacher said, hold it, hold it. God's not gone. That's a trick of the devil to get you think God. No, he said, preacher, God is gone. I buried my mother about two months ago and I looked down on her cold, marble face and I wasn't moved upon the least bit. I buried my sister. I looked down on her dead face. There wasn't a move. He said, preacher, my heart is like a stone. You're looking up here tonight at this little sweaty preacher that rather trifle. Listen, I'd rather trifle. I'd rather play with lightning as to trifle with the Holy Ghost. I'd rather reach over in the corner and get a beady eyed rattlesnake and kiss it right in the mouth and rub his face on my face as to trifle with the Holy Ghost. That's the most dangerous thing that anybody can possibly do is to trifle with the Holy Ghost. I turned to Indianapolis where I pastored. A 19-year-old boy jumped out of one of those big buildings (laughs) and when his body hit the concrete, burst it all to pieces. Ambulance came screaming, screaming down the street Probably I told you this story, but I feel like telling it again. The crowd gathered and looked on that beautiful teenage boy. Preacher elbowed his way through the crowd. Somebody recognized the preacher. Said, preacher, my God, preacher, why would a young boy, teenager, do something like this? The preacher looked at him and said, you never know what you'll do when you grieve God away, when you say no to God for the last time. That's right. There's people right here in this room and I love you and I know tonight's the last night. I don't have to preach this way. There was a lot of messages that I could preach tonight. 
I don't have to preach this way, but I'm fighting for somebody's soul here in this room. People right here in this section, in the back, middle section, maybe up front. Same way with the section over here in the back, the middle section up front. You're here, you're not saved. You know I preach the truth. Down deep in your heart, you do have a spiritual need. How many believe that I preach the truth and I put your hand up? Will you tell me the truth? How is it with your soul? Don't walk out of this tabernacle the last night of the camp saying no to Jesus. When you know down deep you have a need, Jesus loves you and he wants to meet your need. Don't walk out procrastinating, putting it off until the more convenient. See, don't do that. It won't be long until these lights will be turned down and these doors will be shut and locked. And probably you'll be in your automobile going to your place of, of abode, lost without Christ. You really remember this little sweaty preacher. Brother Cope, I, I feel like that I won't see some of these people anymore after tonight. There'll be some of these people I probably won't see anymore. The next time I see you, we'll be at the judgment. And I don't want one of you to shake your bloody, bony finger at me and say, my God, Brother Smart, why didn't you tell me the truth that Thursday night? I did. Jesus said, you won't come to me that you might have don't let anything stop you. If you need to be saved, come on, let's get right with God. If you need to be sanctified, come on, let's pray. If you're in a backsliding condition, come on, let's have a close in prayer before this camp comes to a close. Would you do that? God bless you. Bow your heads for a minute. Father, take this broken message and use it any way you see fit. I wish I could have done better, but I did the best I could under circumstances. I pray that you'll take this message and use it just any way you see fit. Please stop that man, stop that woman, stop that young person. Don't let him go to hell. Don't let him walk out unsaved. I feel like somebody's here, dear Lord, their back is toward the celestial city. Their face is on a downward plunge. And they're rushing off into eternity as the unlock wheels to time can turn. Please. Help that man, help that woman, help that mother, help that father, help that young person. Make it, make it easy for him to come to the altar. Make it hard for him to say no. If you're gonna come to the altar now, I want you to get up, every head's bowed, no one's looking around. If you wanna pray, Brother Smart will be glad to have prayer with you before I leave this part of the country. If you want to pray, you come. If you don't want to, just remain where you are. But there's people all over the congregation that has a need. I'm just going to leave it up to you. God bless your heart. God bless you, brother. God bless you. There's some mothers and fathers and husbands and wives here in the room that needs to come to this altar and pray before this camp comes to a close. I have no idea what lies beyond these camp doors. I have no idea. I'm not trying to scare you, but I've seen some things, man. I've seen some things. I don't know what it's going to do, what it's going to be to, to get you to come. I don't know what it's going to take. I mean, only God knows. Maybe you felt the pull just a little while ago, but you don't feel too much of a pull now. In the day that you hear his voice, 